time for another exciting episode of Crazy Gardening Questions, episode three. No, that's six. Three. First question here is from Diane. She writes, wow, thank you. Lots of great info. Okay, she's writing about my little how to grow your own tobacco, the Survival Gardener's Guide to Growing Tobacco. Lots of great info, and I love your addition of humor. When I made the molasses recipe for chew, it was too gooey, so I let it sit out covered with coffee filters instead of the skull can lid too long and it grew mold. Darn. We'll try again with your recipe and store in the fridge or freezer. Yeah, I mean, that's probably where you should keep it. Uh, unless you cook enough of the moisture out of it that the sugar and the salt will just keep it from spoiling. Because you get to a certain level and the stuff just doesn't spoil anymore. Do you know the best way to store dry tobacco leaves long term? Maybe in paper bags? I'm afraid they're going to collect dust hanging around too long. Yeah, I hung them up in the barn, and they definitely got dust in them, and they got spiders in them, and all that sort of stuff. But it's still probably better than smoking anything that came from a factory. So, I mean, a little bit of spider here, you know, a little bit of dust there. But no, um, I, I hang them up until they dry out, and then I uh, put them aside. I'll put them in Ziploc bags and just let them sit. Once they're good and dry, though, I don't want them to sit moist in Ziploc bags and rot. Let them get really good and dry, put them in Ziploc bags, stick them in a closet. I've stuck them in jars, stuffed them in jars, and put them in closets, that sort of thing. If you want to keep a certain level of humidity, you could probably make some sort of a humidor situation, like they keep cigars. Um, maybe put a sponge with a little bit of water inside of a cooler or something and stuff it all in there. But I, I really think you're probably going to be fine just keeping them in bags. and You can re-moisturize them when you're going to use them for something. She also asks, is it okay to rinse them and let dry before hanging? That's when they're still green. Yeah, you can rinse them. Um, I've rinsed them off and just shaken them out and dried them. Just make sure that they don't sit wet or they're going to rot. And then she sent me some nice photos for the, the book. The first photo is of Cuban Havana seedlings. And the second photo here is Tennessee chewing tobacco grown in pots in Zone 5. So thank you very much for that. Diane, and she says there was no fertilizer used. They could be greener if she used fish emulsion. And yeah, they, they like fish emulsion. They like uh, actually even more nitrogen than that. You can give them just about anything and get them nice and big. The thing is, is that the tobacco tends to get a little more bitter if you give it more nitrogen. So starved, you'll probably get a little milder, nicer uh, smoke, but you don't get nearly as much leaf growth or mass at the end. Now here is another question. Eileen asks about the food forest that's for sale. We want to create a food forest where we currently live, but we have had county Gestapo issues with other things on our tiny quarter acre property. What is the reason you are selling? Is it too much to maintain? No, it's not too much to maintain. As a matter of fact, a food forest becomes easier to maintain as it gets older. When they're young, you have to go out there and you got to water them and you got to keep the grass back from the trunks of the trees. If you want them to grow fast, you've got to stay on top of them. And uh, as they get bigger, the canopy starts to cover the ground and it starts to become less of a problem. If you have a lot of mulch at the beginning, that helps keep it from being a big deal of keeping the grass back. But we spend a lot of time hoeing around the trees and knocking the grass away from them and then mulching when we can get it and throwing paper down and then mulching on top of it again and feeding and all that sort of thing until they hit about year two and then they start to get better. And then year three, they really jump. And now we're in year five on the food forest. And I don't really have to do anything except go out there with a string trimmer and I prune and I graft when I feel like it and I harvest fruit. And it's not a lot of work. I got rid of my lawnmower over a year ago and I just quit mowing. Uh, the string trimmer is good enough. I've got nice paths between islands across the yard. And I let some of the native weeds pop up and native wildflowers show up and the wildlife likes it and all kinds of stuff likes it. So. No, it actually gets easier, and the reason I'm selling is because I am looking at some opportunities further south, and I really want to do some research into tropical agriculture, and I feel like I conquered this system, and I built something beautiful, and I know if I stay here another few years, this thing is going to be just incredible. It's already gotten to the point where we've got fruit almost year-round, and it will be year-round in probably another year or two. There's a lot of stuff coming in still, and the citrus is really starting to kick. The fig trees are really starting to kick. Uh, we got a lot of figs this year, and we've gotten lots and lots of mulberries, gallons of mulberries, and I've got about 10 different varieties of mulberries out there. So the stuff is 
really getting um, super productive. But if I sell it and I can take that money and go start another project, I am I just want to start from scratch again and build something completely new. And I'm really excited about that. So no, I don't really actually have to sell. We could live here indefinitely and um, enjoy it. But adventure beckons. And for the sake of research on my books, I really want to try some stuff that I can't quite try here. Um, we we're right on the edge of the tropical and the temperate. So I can grow a lot of tropical stuff, but I can't grow all of it. I can grow a lot of temperate stuff, and I can't grow all of it. So I would I would almost rather go to Iceland to try it out or to, you know, um, Arizona or to go way down south where it's warmer year round and and grow. I mean, even Southern California would be really fun to try out. But you know, anyhow, um, no, we're uh, we're just ready to get some adventure going, and that's why we listed our place for sale. Recently, also, I've been answering quite a few questions on composting, and I'll tell you, the easiest way to compost is to dig a pit and throw a bunch of stuff in it, and don't worry if it's paper plates or if it's meat or if it's bread or whatever else just dig a pit throw a bunch of stuff in it plant on top and you will succeed whatever you plant on top there is going to do well and I talk about that in my book compost everything the good guide to extreme composting you bury it in a pit and you bury it deep enough the animals don't get to it the smell isn't a problem and the tree roots or the plant roots or whatever you plant on top is going to love it I call the idea melon pits, but I actually borrowed it from Steve Solomon, who talked about how the Native Americans used to bury and then plant on top of what they buried. So it's the same thing, but I plant melons on top of those pits because the melons really seem to like all that extra fertility. And they'll run out and cover the grass all around from that first pit that I dug and filled with whatever rough compost I don't feel like piling on a pile. So I'll catch you all next time. Be sure to like and subscribe, and have a great rest of the week. Isn't it the do to do to do? It's not the song. It's not the song. Oh. It's gotta have the do to do to do to be the song. Okay, figure it out. Maybe I'm amazed at the way you compost all.